2 Series Grand Coupe is BMW's most affordable sedan. This four-door pillarless coupe will come at an estimated starting price of Rs 32 lakhs and will sit comfortably below the 3 Series. Expected to go on sale around Diwali, it will take on Mercedes' new A-Class sedan and Audi's new A3. Let's get straight behind the wheel. 190 horsepower diesel is incidentally similar to the one under the bonnet of the 320D and in this lighter car feels like it has plenty of grunt. Successive generations of BMW's 2.0-litre diesel have become smoother, more silent and more refined and this one is clearly the best one yet. There's no grumble, there's no growl, there's not much clatter and put your foot down and there's a nice slug of torque. Now that spike in power you used to get around 2000 rpm, that isn't there. But what you do get is a sense of continuously building power, of sort of seamless thrust all the way up to 5000 rpm. And that makes it really fun to drive. While it does get a bit grumbly in the last 1000 rpm of the power band, performance is strong and 0 to 100 comes up in a claimed 7.5 seconds. Go past 100 km an hour and there's no let up in performance either. BMW has even specified it with an improved version of its 8 speed gearbox that's smooth and quick. So, yes, if it's a diesel you want, this engine is unlikely to disappoint. The 2 Series even feels neat and tidy to drive from behind the wheel. Now, it isn't as agile as something like a 3 Series, and there is a bit of shuffle at the front and a bit of understeer when you really go hard. But all in all, this is quite a fun car to drive and what makes it even nicer is that the harder you drive it, the more compact and better it feels. Also nice is that there's a good amount of heft and feel from the steering. Stability at high speed is good and even the brakes are nice and strong and deliver plenty of confidence. The 2 Series also rides well. The suspension is extremely silent. Even over poorly paved roads, the springs absorb road shocks without tossing you around and the damping is superb. Now the ride quality is pretty good and that's especially because this car has adaptive dampers that round off the bumps a bit better. But when the car comes to India with our higher profile tires and a similar raise in the suspension, it should be even better. So all in all, extremely impressive. It even looks like a proper BMW. Up front you get the latest interpretation of BMW's kidney grill. It's a bit more stand-up and looks a bit more aggressive and what you also get are raked back headlights and neat double barrel LED detailing. Walk around the side and you are greeted by the 2 Series Grand Coupe's interesting and flowing roofline that ends in a fastback like rear. Similar in profile to the 3 and 5 GT but not as proportionate or clean looking, the 2 Series Grand Coupe also gets a stronger shoulder line and a chunky rear with BMW's L-shaped LED tail lights standing out. So what's it like on the inside? Pretty impressive. Get into the cabin and you realize this is no bottom feeder. It feels just as nicely put together as BMW's twice its price. The cabin is slightly narrower and a bit tighter than the 3, but the driving position is spot on and seat comfort is well, very impressive. The large front seats have generous side support, the cushioning on the thick seat is just right and the best bit is that once you are nestled in the seat, it just holds you in place. What makes sitting inside even more impressive is that everything you touch is of very high quality. The high grain leather wrap steering with its aluminium frame and thick rim feels fantastic to hold 
and press the sintered aluminium pedals behind the wheel to change a gear and they feel just super. BMW's digital instrument panel up front is also tech sharp. The iDrive touchscreen is bright and slick to use and since the Acorn vents and buttons that surround it have been taken from the new 3 Series, quality levels are very high. Not a massive amount of space here, it clearly is tighter in the back than something like a 3 Series, marginally tighter. Now this seat is set for my driving position and yes, knee room is pretty good, you can put your feet under the seat. There's plenty of space here for your feet, a decent amount of knee room. Uh, thigh support isn't all that good, it's a bit short the seat and although the backrest is nice and comfortable and well inclined, you do have a bit of tightness here on the top. Now BMW have scooped out the roof but if you're over six feet tall or around six feet tall you could make contact with the roof on a particularly bad road. You do get vents here for the back so it'll cool the cabin nicely, a couple of USBs here but three abreast in this car not a good idea. The 2 Series Grand Coupe is also well equipped. There's wireless charging on the center console up front, a clever ledge to hold your phone in place, there are strips of funky trim that light up in bright colors and the 2 Series Grand Coupe also comes with gesture control with some new gestures recently added. With prices for the 2 Series Grand Coupe likely to start at around 32 lakhs with the top of the line variants going all the way to 38 lakhs, this is a car that works well on many levels. If you've always wanted a BMW sedan but couldn't stretch your budget as far up as a 3 Series, the 2 Series is sure to have tremendous appeal. The high quality cabin delivers a genuine BMW experience, the performance of diesel is strong, the ride is extremely comfortable and the Grand Coupe is pleasant to drive too. And if you don't like a diesel, there's a Zingy 190 horsepower 220i also on the cards. Yes, the cabin is a bit cramped like the rest of the cars in this class and not everybody will fall for this car's looks. But if you are looking for a more accessible, more affordable BMW sedan that does most things right, the 2 Series Grand Coupe could just be it. Just don't expect it to drive like a 3 Series. Now just because we've been good responsible citizens and staying in our houses and away from our motorcycles, that doesn't mean we're not allowed to dream about them. In fact, that's where a majority of my day ends up going. And that's kind of where we got the idea for this series of videos. You see, we ride almost every new vehicle out there and we tell you about it. And we often do comparison reviews as well. But you never get to really hear our thoughts on what our favorite vehicles are across a whole category or price point. And that's what we're going to do here today. We're going to give you a series of our favorite products starting with the incredibly popular scooter segment. So here goes our top 5 favorite scooters, starting with the TVS Jupiter at number 5. The reason the Jupiter makes it to this list is that it is our choice for all those of you who want a no-nonsense practical scooter. Why? Well, the TVS Jupiter has always had a nice engine, but it takes the edge in terms of suspension comfort and the fact that it has 12-inch wheels on both ends which makes it feel much more stable in the competition. We haven't yet had a chance to ride the new PS6 model, but there's no reason for things to change massively. But before we go on to number 4, there is one thing to consider, and that is that Honda has taken years to get the job done, but the new Activa 6G now finally offers some of the features that made the Jupiter so good in the first place. Features like a telescopic fork, a 12-inch front wheel, and an external fuel filler cap. And the moment the world stops being crazy, we're gonna go find out if the new Jupiter has what it takes to retain its crown. But until then, let's move on to number 4, which is the Aprilia SR160. It's been 4 years since the SR150 came out, and I still think that this is the most stylish and sporty looking scooter out there. The SR also rides like no other scooter, and that's thanks to its 14 inch wheels and the fact that it has a massive wheelbase which is even longer than many commuter motorcycles. Throw in a stiff suspension setup, firm brakes and a peppy motor and you have the most sporty scooter riding experience India has to offer. In fact, Aprilia has even given the SR a new 160cc engine to meet the BS6 regulations and the scooter is now called the SR160. 
Now we're waiting to ride the SR160, but its new fuel injected motor is essentially the same as the old carbureted 150, but with a slightly longer stroke. The result is 11.1 .1 horsepower and 11.6 newton meters of torque, which makes this the most powerful scooter on sale in India today. So why is the SR so far down our list? Well, it makes too many compromises in its quest to have fun. The suspension only really works on super smooth roads. The seat is quite tall and is not very comfortable either. Then there's a fact that the 14 inch wheels eat into the storage space. And the floorboard isn't very spacious either. Basically, it's just not a very practical machine. And that's something Aprilia intends to address with the upcoming brand new SXR160, which is scheduled to go on sale in September this year. Until then, let's get to number 3 on our list. Suzuki India goes through the effort of making purpose-built models just for our market and the Bergman Street is one of them. This is Suzuki's idea of a maxi scooter for the masses and under that substantial looking bodywork is an Access 125 platform. The result is a premium and expensive looking scooter and it comes as no surprise that the Bergman is a full 7000 rupees more expensive than the Access. What you get for your extra money is a smart looking scooter with a more spacious seat. However, what lets the Burton Street down is that it isn't really a more spacious scooter for tall riders. Now I find that the handlebar hits my knees during tight turns. And if you ask me, that sort of defeats the purpose of buying a maxi scooter. And it's why the Burton ranks below the next scooter in our list. Number 2. Suzuki Access 125 the Access 125 is a product that single-handedly changed Suzuki's fortunes in India. It is by far their best-selling product and it's gone on to build quite a fan following over the years. Why? Well, it follows a pretty simple, no-nonsense formula. The Access 125 offers straightforward design, no unnecessary features, and it packs a very quick and enjoyable 125cc engine, an engine that simply outclasses its primary Japanese rival. The Access manages to be quite fuel efficient as well, but the best part of the package is that it's priced very competitively. If you want a quick, no-nonsense scooter to commute on, you simply can't go wrong with the Access 125. But if you're looking for a scooter that puts the biggest possible smile on your face, well, the scooter at the top of our list is in a league of its own. Number 1. TVS n 125 Ask anyone in the Autoco office what scooter they'd like to own, and you'll probably hear the same answer. In fact, three of us actually do own this scooter and it is the TVS N-Top. Now, the N-Top ranks so highly because its suspension balances comfort and sportiness really well. But that's just one of the reasons. The n is also the quickest 125cc scooter we've tested to date and it even manages to outpace the Aether 450. But the n brings so much more to the table in the form of its detailed LCD display and a Bluetooth connectivity function that even enables turn-by-turn -turn navigation. The NTOC also gets fuel injection and a funky looking full LED headlamp. What seals the deal for me personally is that the NTOC is very well priced, but it's also one of the only scooters in India that I can comfortably fit on without my knees touching the handlebars. For all you tall riders out there, this is a really big deal, but the NTOC manages to do this without compromising on comfort for shorter riders. Downsides? Well, I ran an NTOC long term for many months and I discovered that it's not a very fuel efficient machine. Now don't get me wrong, if you ride it slowly and carefully, you will get decent numbers. But the thing is that the NTOX engine and exhaust note and suspension, it all really encourages you to ride as fast as you can for sustained periods of time. And that's when the fuel efficiency drops. But the thing is, the NTOX has so many things going in its favor that that one thing isn't enough and this scooter remains our firm favorite. That marks the end of our top 5 list in the scooter category. But before we go, we've got to give a shout out to the fact that we now have 3 high quality made in India EVs in the form of the Aether 450X, the Bajaj Chetak and the TVS iQ. Now all 3 are genuinely impressive, but unfortunately you can only buy them in 1 or 2 cities at the moment and that's why they don't make this list. And with that, it's time to wrap up. We hope you found this useful because once the lockdown starts to lift, affordable forms of personal transport like scooters will probably become even more popular.
Drag racing is one of the oldest and most basic levels of motorsport that really showcase what the cars are capable of and every year at the Auto Car Drag Day we bring together cars from various segments in a head-to-head -head fight for bragging rights. The format? Simple. A quarter mile of 402 meters of perfect tarmac, in this case the airstrip at Ambi Valley in Lonavla, about 120 kilometers from Mumbai, two drivers, a set of start lights and pedal to the metal. Now these two behind me are probably the most popular cars of 2019, the Kia Seltos and the MG Hector. Both of these are turbo petrol, both of these have dual clutch automatic transmissions, but which one is quicker? Well, we have a drag strip with us, let's find out. Both the Seltos and the Hector are also somewhat similar in terms of the amount of power and torque they put out, with the Kia making 140 horsepower and 242 newton meters, and the MG slightly more powerful at 143 horsepower and 250 newton meters of torque. So let's see how they perform. While the Kia is lower on power and torque, a slicker gearbox meant that the Korean pulled away from the line and powered through to win the race. It set a time of 17.599 seconds, which was over a second faster than the MG's 18.747 second sprint. So why was the MG slower? Well, that is mainly due to the fact that the dual clutch gearbox on the Kia is just far more superior than the one on the MG and prefers a flat out driving style more. And even though the MG was launched as hard as possible, the slow to respond DSG box that underpins the Hector meant that it was slow off the line, thus losing out to the Seltos at the end of the quarter mile. Now compact SUVs are a very very popular segment in India and there's been a growing trend in the compact SUV segment with turbo petrol engines. Now behind me is the Hyundai Venue, which of course is one of the most popular and highest selling compact SUV in the country today, and the Mahindra XUV300, which also has a turbo petrol engine. But which one is quicker? Which one is the more performance oriented one? Let's find out. As we mentioned, both of these cars get a turbo petrol engine. The XUV300 gets a bigger 1.2 litre, making 110 horsepower and 200 newton meters of torque while the venue gets a smaller 1 litre motor, making more power at 120 horsepower, but less torque at 172 newton meters. So, one has more horses, one has more torque, how close will they be? That's the big question. Close, very very close. The XUV300 wins the sprint with a time of 17.746 seconds here but by a literal whisker, 0.017 or 17 thousandths of a second in front of the venue 17.763 and even in Formula 1 that is practically nothing. Goes to show how close these two really are in terms of performance. Turbocharged petrol engines might be the flavour of the season but we here at Autocar still love ourselves a nice plucky diesel and these two behind me are the perfect example. The Ford Figo and the Polo from Volkswagen both in their top spec trims both with over 200 newton meters of torque both which gives you big smile on your faces. You've seen Ford vs Ferrari, let's now see Ford vs Volkswagen. Now both these cars get a 1.5-litre diesel engine with a 5-speed manual. The Figo is a little lower on power and torque at 100 horsepower and 215 newton meters, while the Polo is rated at 110 horsepower and 250 newton meters of torque. And when the lights went green, these little talky cars with their tyres squealing for mercy let out a puff of black smoke and off they went. 
Surprisingly, the Figo took the race with a time of 16.988 seconds, nearly half a second faster than the higher powered Polo's 17.501. Why? Well, the Polo has a rev limiter in neutral or when the clutch is engaged and that makes it impossible to launch the car hard. The Ford's gearbox on the other hand lets you launch the Figo right at peak torque and is also just overall more superior which means it does not lose time going through the gears. Ford won against Ferrari at Le Mans and now at the drag strip it wins against Volkswagen too. What is a shame though is that the Polo GT TDI has now been discontinued as that diesel engine doesn't meet BS6 emission norms. If you enjoyed these we certainly have a lot more coming your way in future episodes where cars get faster, times get lower and competition gets intense. And now it's time for tips on sustainability and protecting the environment with Servo Futura G Plus from Indian Oil. Choose a smaller car if you don't need the size and space. Overloading the car with weight makes it work harder.